Welcome to the Way We Capture podcast. This is a podcast that is dedicated to photography and aims to provide guidance and support to individuals looking to improve their photography skills. The podcast focuses on self-development and also discusses the future of technology and image processing. Through the podcast, listeners can learn about various techniques, tools, and resources to enhance their creativity and productivity. The podcast also explores the creative process behind capturing stunning photographs and how to effectively communicate through photography and storytelling. This week's guest, Carolina Sand. Carolina is a mindful embodiment guide. She has a PhD in psychophysical acting. She is a writer and content creator on X as well. It is definitely in your best interest to listen to this episode. Let's dive right into it. Welcome to the Way We Capture podcast. I have a really special guest today. I've been waiting to have this conversation with this dear friend I made online a few months ago. This is Carolina Sand. Carolina, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, you said it perfectly. Hi, yes, Zach. I'm so it. glad to be here finally. Thank you for the invitation. You are so welcome. And just thank you for being on. And I know that you had um, a busy holiday season with your kids recently. So I do appreciate you making the time to clear the schedule, reschedule again. Um, I'm just glad you're finally here and we have this nice slice of time to get to know each other again. <laughs> yes. So do you, do you want to tell the audience a little bit about what you do and how you got to where you're at now? Yeah, sure. Uh, Zach, yeah, I'd love to. So uh, I'm a I'm a actor by trade um, and a writer, a playwright and a director. And my my whole sort of um, all of my life, really, a career life, ever since I started earning money, I've been in theater in some form of, of performing, performing arts. Um, and I started that in Finland a long time ago, um, but very early on in my kind of um, looking at that path, it was clear to me I, had, I was gonna leave Finland because Finland only had one school where you could become an actor. And as a very stubborn 19 year old, I was not willing for anybody to decide what I was gonna do. And to tell me um, at that age or at that stage of my life that I wasn't going to be able to do what I wanted to do. So um, I ended up in the UK, actually, and working immediately for a professional theatre company. And then later on, I did my BA um, and I went straight into an MPhil PhD. So I skipped the MA phase um, of that of that process and throughout that time i was i was really working as a performer on the side of my studies um, and i got very into i was very intrigued by how we work like <laughs> as human beings because as a performer you know there are all these very usual ideas about what acting is you know quite commonly people think it's about pretending or it's about being able to lie um, which for some people it might be, there are some famous actors who, who say I'm a very good liar, um, you know, <laughs> but they do. So yeah. there, there's never black and white answers. To Absolutely. Anything, right. But uh, for me, it was very clear early on that I was being asked to not be myself somehow. Like people were saying, be less, do be less Carolina. And also they were asking me not to act. Very early on, like in my 20s, they were saying to me, like teachers would say to me, um, don't don't act, don't pretend. And I was kind of going, wait, what? Like, <laughs> isn't that I'm not Hamlet, you know, <laughs> like, what are we doing here? So I became really interested in what does that mean? You know, and what does it mean that when you walk down a street and, you know, you probably do yards, but I'm going to go for meters here. Yeah, so yeah. like 100 hundred meters down the road, you know, walks a friend and you know, that's them because of how they embody, like out of all of the silhouettes, you know, that's your friend, Jack over there. And when he comes closer, you might even notice that maybe he's not having a great day from the way he embodies. Right. So I became really interested in that early on. And that took me into a lot of psychophysical actor training, which is like uh 
everything is psychophysical, right? That's yes. kind of an, an, an unnecessary term in some ways, but, but there are kind of different approaches to performance. And one of them is more about how to create this unity between the intention or the thought and the action that you portray. Um, and that's often kind of referred more to like this psychophysical unity, psychophysical training. Um, and yeah, I just became, that became very obsession. early on my <laughs> obsession. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I love that. So, yeah. So my PhD is on the notion of self and no self in psychophysical actor training, which is the same realm of experimentation. And later on in my career, I, um, I started to create contemplative performance that had everything was revolving around states of being and bringing forth these, these kind of states of being where the performer is not acting and the performance itself is emerging in the space from, the, from, from what's in the space. Um, and I particularly worked with that a lot with singing. So I would have my, um, I would have performances where I would sing the audience. I would sing their song um, from the the kind of beingness, togetherness of the event. Yeah, it's a because I was interested in life affirming work mm -hmm. and being being able to be and be seen, which it, which are these fundamental needs we have. Um, and gifts we can give other people to really be with with somebody to really see them and to be able to reflect back to them the experience of who they are um so yeah i was pretty i'm pretty obsessed with this stuff <laughs> I'm not even 10 minutes in and i'm loving this so it's so <laughs> interesting to hear your story and everything you do because a lot of a lot of your writing it, it's always it's so captivating and it's so Thank you. It's so reassuring that like that we are existing in this human experience together, mm. not just by ourselves. And mm. I think one of the biggest problems we have in especially this digital world is and with the youth and in a post COVID world is uh, loneliness. There's yeah. so much loneliness around and it's like yeah. the silent pandemic almost. But a lot mm. of your work is kind of just takes it back to the one thing you can control, which is yourself. And mm. So I've always resonated with a lot of your work, especially when uh, I first started seeing it in that group of creators. It was like, oh, like, what is she about? Like, she, Carolina's got some emotional intelligence sauce, as the kids would say. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was always just really curious to see how your approach to... Cause like I, I talk a lot about like being in alignment with your potential mm. self and then I see your work and you're like, well, you just like live in alignment. I'm like, okay, well that's, that's a completely <laughs> different thought, but it makes a lot more sense when you say it like that. So I could just tell mm. it comes from years of trial and error of being a creative. And that's really mm. all it is, is experimentation. That's what creativity really is, is experimenting in ways of expressing yourself to your authentic side rather than mm. the, the false flag you're pushing out into the world. And that's a lesson mm. a lot of people have to learn early. But I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna lead into our first question that I have structured out for you. So because mm. you've successfully merged the worlds of academic study and practical application in acting, how do you mm. think this blend has influenced your approach to creativity and self-expression? Oh, well, that's a beautiful question. Uh, I think there's a pre-clause to that, which is just the way that I manifest as a person. Okay. Um, so I have merged those things, but I, but I also am those things. So for me, very early on, it was very clear that I had this academic mind. You know, it's a kind of mind that we have. And, uh, and it can be really developed or, you know, <laughs> it's very good to learn to shut yes. it off. Well, I really recommend that part because <laughs> otherwise it can get really out of hand. Um, but I, but I think for me, <clears throat> excuse me, for me, um, reading and studying was probably there before theater really 
came onto the scene properly, you know. So that was like uh, your first love, per se? Well, if I, maybe this is a lie. Maybe they were there like at the same time because at some point, um, a brown, when I was about 12 or 13, I was starting to, to make theater um, and I was starting to like live at the library. Like there was a point at which I had read so many Agatha Christie books that it, that 20 pages in, Zach, I knew who'd done it. And that's when I went, I'm not reading anymore because I don't want to know who's done it. 20 pages in, you know, it just became this thing. So, <clears throat> so for me, the relationship um, between practical application I even would question, you know, this separation of con of contemplating writing or contemplating ideas. I don't actually perceive that as separated from practical ap application for me, because what we engage in influences how we embody, like how you are able to articulate, how you write, how you think is what's influencing constantly your embodiment you know for for whatever in whatever direction you know so i feel like that relationship is very intimate and um and for sure i mean some of the books i had to read were like you know <laughs> they were not fun reads when i was because i did my PhD in my 20s. So like I was kind of going, oh, I go, what the heck's going on here? You know, but then by the second and third read, or if like I come back to some of that material much later on, it's like it's 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 seeped into the system, you know. Um, and I think that's what study does. Um, and I think one of the really important things is that study really. I know it's not this experience for the many, but studying for me is fun. Yes. Like, you know, I love it. Like, I think that's the academic brain you were talking about. <laughs> There's, I would argue the majority of people do not see studying as a fun time. Yeah. That, but I think you can yeah. trick yourself into it. And I only say that because I hated studying. I hated homework growing up. And so yeah. I was never like the academic kind of kid. I, I wanted to study psychology in high school because I was, oh, humans are fun. Like human behavior is way fun. Let's start mm. tapping into how the human mind works. But yeah. that became like a really difficult path, really expensive in the US. And it was just like, I don't know if I'm 100% sure that this is what I want to embody. Right. And so it became, <laughs> it didn't become like the, whole piece of the puzzle but it became definitely like a part of it you know i've yeah. it's a general curiosity that i followed into some depth because of content marketing and some other things yeah. but it's just those seeds of curiosity when they get planted so early and all of a sudden you realize oh well like my brain is malleable like i can become mm. something that i wasn't yeah. before like anything's possible and so I did, I tricked myself and brainwashed myself into loving to study and loving to do deep work yeah. and analysis of um, really like scientific journals or different self-improvement books that it would other be otherwise be deemed boring, especially from like mm. a spiritual sense, because there's a lot of people who mm. they get into business and they look down upon like the spiritual woo-woo kind of tactics that go on <laughs> but there's a lot of <coughs> unexplained phenomena that occurs in our day-to-day -day life mm. and so i think when people start studying neuroscience and how the brain works and how their mind works there's always those unexplained situations that occur and, and yeah. we're like okay like we have no explanation for this so <laughs> sometimes i feel like that brings people closer to maybe a higher power or a creator but also, mm. I've found that it can have the opposite effect based off of how their own belief in themselves works. So, mm. it I mean, it's all just subjective to, you know, the individual, right? It's like, I don't want to speak in generalizations of people, but yeah. I think based on different, like, Western versus Eastern society and how we see ourselves in place of, like, the 
the group, right? I know Western and Eastern Europe are very different places in how people think and how people mm. re relate to one another with their community. Even the next village along, man. Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah. humans, I've lived in a lot of countries. Yeah. The next village along it's is a different country, so like you everywhere. Moved to, uh, <laughs> you moved to two different countries, right? You've, you've had to restart from three, three different countries. Okay. So far so far so that I'm is liking them it seems <laughs> tell, tell me those countries finland being one that you lived in yeah so then i went to the uk, UK. from the, then i was a nomad for some years but don't tell the finnish government <laughs> and <laughs> and um, then i moved to mexico oh, uh, and i really? was there yeah i was there for quite a long time and then from mexico just just in december of covid like when it had started but nobody knew I moved to Estonia. Really? Wow. That is quite the journey. Yeah. I, so I always like looking at people who move to different countries. My mother's a fantastic example. She moved from, so I was born in the UK. Um, I uh -huh. moved over to the US when I was just a kid. And my mom was a single mother of three boys. Come on over. And hard. So it, very hard. Very hard. So wow. it, I always have so much respect for women who do something like that because it reminds me of my mother. It's like you need mm. to be high agency to get up and leave yeah. that comfort that comfort zone of my country, what I'm what I know, start from zero, potentially different language, different customs. Yeah. So that's that's incredible. That's like times three. And how do you like living yeah. in Estonia? <laughs> how is it like? Yeah, how oh, how is it in Estonia? There there are beautiful things in Estonia that I really appreciate. Um so I'm in the capital and it's tiny and you can get anywhere in 30 minutes. Oh, like, that's nice. You you got to appreciate that. Yeah, exactly. You know, and um and like like countries <clears throat> in this area, you know, the Scandinavia and here, it's really safe. Mm -hmm. So like my my older child is seven uh, soon and he'll go to school um, and he'll be able very soon to start walking to school by himself. And that's the standard. You know, that's what people do. And it's perfectly safe for that. So those are things that I know to appreciate really a lot I'm because sure. it because it's a different kind of quality of life. Although I wouldn't, you know, I I'm not even if i think of living in mexico with the kids and how what, how that would be organized and it wouldn't have those kinds of things there are lots of benefits in that too so i don't really <clears throat> want to kind of suggest that one thing is better than the other it's just a different way of living um and i think we all need to you know consider what what that looks like for for everybody but yeah estonia is is, is it's tiny and it's cute you know, and it comes with all the perks of yeah. tininess and cuteness. Like, you know, um, I was hospitalized a couple of months ago. I, I had this, that. yeah, I had this crazy experience. I'm really grateful for it, but you know, it was pretty crazy. And um, and my doctor wrote and wrote to me through the app on Sunday afternoon to see if I was okay because he oh. knew I'd been. My family doctor, like he knew, he knew I had been hospitalized thanks to him on Friday and on Sunday, he's like, and I'm going, see, this isn't, this isn't normal. Like this is not the standard a behavior or like for a family doctor, but that's because I'm in a tiny little place, you know, where they can it's, do it's that. It's wonderful. It, it almost is like, it's, it's how society started was these smaller connections and not yeah. such a broad metropolis. Like I, I know living in the U S it's like, I think I live in a small little town, right? So I live in a small town and I really love it, but yeah. there's not a lot of opportunity. And because I'm so young, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, uh, th this next year, like I need to go move to a big city. It's like, yeah, I need to go grow and experience <laughs> what the world has to offer rather than staying in my hometown. Mm. And that's important. I think everybody has their own timeline for this path that they're on. And so yeah. it's almost like the universe is knocking for me. It's like, okay, it's time to, <laughs> it's time to move on to bigger things. <laughs> but based because we're on the topic of motherhood, I do want to ask you this question. Mm. So has becoming a mother changed or influenced your artistic perspective or the way you approach your characters and scripts? Um, 
Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, that's a really interesting question in many ways. I think there are things, I this is a delicate thing yes. and I can't speak for somebody else. But if I speak for myself, I don't think however creative I have been and I am as a person, I, I could never have understood uh, motherhood, childhood even, because when one is a child, that's a different kind of experience to when one experiences childhood again, which is what happens uh, once, once, once we have kids. So it's like a bird's eye perspective, like a third person view of childhood. It's, I would actually say it's like, if we are open to having, doing conscious parenting, mm -hmm. what you're actually doing is you're having the experiences again, reflect like when the child has a certain experience what comes up in you often uh particularly if it's something that upsets you or where you kind of lose connection mm -hmm. what's happening is that my inner child if you like that term can mean a lot of things but i mean it concretely yeah. like my childhood when i was eight months old and having a hissy fit comes up yeah. And you wouldn't have ever had this connection in your brain without having a child. A child. I, I wouldn't have. I, okay. it's, mm, I would never have imagined that process. I could never have imagined that process. And also, like, it's a great, it's such a strong spiritual transformative path because um, what happens also a lot, well, what happens actually all the time is that we the first initial ways that we deal with things is the automatic way that we were dealt with. Uh, yeah. And those ways are not always, you know, they're not always healthy. <laughs> That's true. Well, they're not always what we want to continue doing or we want to have at the very least we want to have a choice. Yes. Right? But to create that choice, you know, it's a whole process of rewiring, of working it out, of of, of starting to go backwards in the reactivity because it's so automatic it's just poof, there and it happens so quickly so <laughs> <clears throat> yeah and also kids have emergencies like 24 7 yeah you know oh i can and, recall my own childhood I... <laughs> yeah uh, yeah and the and the primary caretaker which in you know with my kids it's me i'm here i'm the one i'm the one for them you know, that's a huge um, experience to have. And um, so, yeah, I'm completely changed. And also, if I'm honest with you, like I wasn't the I wasn't a, I wasn't a skilled children's adult before this. Okay. I was not skilled with children. Um, but uh, I am now. <laughs> Almost out of necessity, like a lot of things happen in <laughs> Yeah. And I think for me, probably this was always going to happen. Like, you know, I, I, I dreamt my second kid, child, like I dreamt their coming. And I, 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 through that dream, I was, I was woke, woken up like by myself. And I just went, you know what, Carolina, unless you facilitate this being coming, you've not done what you came to do yeah yeah so i have that kind of relationship to this i've you know some might call it that it's quite a sacred way that i look at it mm -hmm. um but I, I also it's also pragmatic it's also chaos it's all those things like the way i write on on x you know it's that thing of going like this is really sacred but my god it's human i, I <laughs> love how you tie certain lessons that you learn through your kids into your writing and how it impacts you and then it's just like there's just snippets of parenthood because one of mm. my my favorite accounts on social media is the daily dad by ryan holiday and he's just teaching people how to be a dad through his own lessons and then taking the stoicism stoicism perspective and kind of mm. placing little anecdotes here and there so yeah i, I think it's important like especially when we're we're young i mean in in america a lot of people are very they're proud of the fact that they don't have kids 
I see yeah. it all the time. My, I think it's a trend at it, the minute. It is a trend at the moment. But yeah. for me, like, I can always kind of measure the intelligence of someone. And this sounds terrible based on, like, if they even want to extend their bloodline and have children. Mm. Mm. I, like I think it's kind of a it's kind of an insult to tell somebody they don't like oh you shouldn't have kids <laughs> it's like <laughs> yeah well it's none of your business like, that's absolutely, the thing absolutely absolutely it's none to, of your business <laughs> so to, like, a, a certain stage in our life where a lot of our <laughs> happiness is dependent on the connections we have and that mm. gives us a will to live I mean mm. there was tons of studies uh, I think Harvard did studies of happiness from 2008 to 2018. And what they found mm. was it's like choosing a life partner is going to determine pretty much your lifespan and like how long you you live. Yeah. And I think yeah. later in life, like what actually gives you the will to get out of bed, you know, continue on with this autonomy is your ability to have children and raise those children into great people. I mean, mm. and it's so complex. And obviously, like you said, it is no one's business, but I think it's something that a lot of young people need to aspire like we like I, I think it's just great to get out of like the individualist mindset every once in a month yeah. in a while because especially in mm -hmm. the US and Canada we are very you know individualist like we we put ourselves first there's tons of narcissism in this country and everybody's mm -hmm. main goal is to make more money make more money and chase mm -hmm. and push back happiness rather than existing in the now mm. and allowing happiness and joy to come into the to the now but i think children are just that you know they're such such extreme levels of chaos and <laughs> joy so yeah it's just everything's a polarization right mm. yeah and the kind of the the chaos is in oneself so yes. so they have a strong experiences because they have these unfiltered human emotions still mm. And their amygdala, you know, their frontal cortex is <clears throat> like not even online, really. So I have to be their frontal cortex. So they have this really, really human, clean kind of experience. And the what makes it chaotic is mostly the adult's coping skills. <laughs> I would say. Thing. Yeah, that's what either, you know, makes it chaotic or not, because... Because it, and it also has this thing of going like it's a real, you know, Eckhart Tolle yeah. kind of goes, don't resist what is. And kids are really great lessons at that because adults will try to resist what is with kids mm -hmm. for so many reasons all day long, you know. And it's an interesting thing to kind of assess. So what, so, you know, okay, my kid throws stuff on the floor, you know, um, I'm sorry for that noise. I don't know how to turn it off. <laughs> I took that away. Um, yeah. So my kid, my four-year-old throws something on the floor today, some food or something, you know, and, and many people might respond to that by going like, we don't throw things on the floor, you know, which is true. I don't particularly want food on my carpet, you know? my rug <clears throat> but you know there's already just from that action there's so much going on inside me depending on like i happen to be washing the dishes so my hands are cold you know and he'd been asking for something and i had been saying just a minute i'm just washing this thing and so i want something that i can't have and he wants something he can't have so that was already going on before the thing goes on the floor, you know, and then and then my instinct is to correct him, which puts my physiology in a certain kind of state, which he immediately mirrors. So there's like so much going on. So then we can talk about like the benefits of a practice of meditation just to allow us as we are in those situations with children to have a real sense of the speed of the mechanisms which drive our behavior, you know, and, at, and how much we have to slow down to be able to have any chance to show up for them in the way that we would choose were we not driven by all of these other things that happen really fast. So I, so so that's an interesting thing, you know, with kids is that um, the chaos mostly is, is 
I mean, it's in the per in the adult and it's in the speed of the thing, you know, because everybody, most, uh, most parents would want, you know, besides money and careers and stuff, what we really want for our kids is for kids to be happy and balanced, you know, and and the generations at the minute, like you're talking about individualism, narcissism, but you know, there's also loneliness, depression, lack of purpose, lack of sense of self, all of these things. And they're like, um, they're not globally present, but they're, they're pretty pre predominant in yeah. many societies, you know, particularly Western societies. And then, and so when I look at my kids, I kind of go, you know, I really hope that they can have a chance at being able to go into adulthood and know what a kind person is like and know to know when somebody's unkind and know to know that that's not okay and know to know that the most important thing is this relationship they have within themselves with themselves and that that relationship then is in relationship to all the rest of it like the the point of the point of power we all have we know this you're right it's not out there but to really know it it's like this you you really got to slow down to go in because you know we're all born beautiful and kind and loving. Like every baby that comes into this world is filled, you know, with, with this beautiful life and this expectation of connection and love and delight and laughter and joy, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, so when we start to have that relationship inwards, we can start to to not go back but to cultivate on with intention being that person because that's who we came here to be do you know <laughs> and but I know. but i don't want to i forget though i forget <laughs> yeah. i think many yeah. of us forget <laughs> yeah but kids also forget mm -hmm. that's the thing cuz suffering is part of the journey mm -hmm. Because if we don't, if we don't suffer, we cannot know joy. Like we can't have one without the other. Absolutely. So we have to suffer. We have to be out of control. We have to screw up. We have to do all of these things because then when the moment comes and we make the right choice, oh man, now it's worth something. Absolutely. You know, that's so beautifully said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that's my take on parenthood <laughs> i love it and i hope everybody who's listening just got some <laughs> immense value from it because i know i did mm. and just back to it like yeah i think we all because of the the speed of life and the times in which we forget ourselves because we're so focused outward rather than inwards yeah. and so I'll, I'll tell you, I'll be a little vulnerable. One of my goals this year is to uh, be a little bit more forgiving and be a little mm. bit, a little bit kind, more kinder than I have been in the past because we get so locked in on a goal and focused on something that almost everything else loses value, but it shouldn't mm. be like that. And so I've attempted to start meditating more and committing myself to more uh, longer time periods of no thought. And specifically, in, how's that going? <laughs> it's going pretty good, I would say. Great. I've actually, within the first three days, it was a couple 15 minute sessions to kind of have an imperfect start. I know that people, you know, they will meditate for 60 minutes or they'll go longer than that. But it's, it's genuinely hard. Like it is, it's a difficult thing, which because it's a challenge, it presents this opportunity to grow. And yeah. so it's like, okay. Um, and I always, I was listening to a podcast and can't even remember which one it was. It was just so funny because the guy who was talking, he's like, um, 
you don't need I, I laugh at people with all these apps and these funny gadgets and videos for meditating and there's different types of meditation but he's like at first he's like just to get into it it's like just set a timer and uh, don't do anything because it's the act of doing nothing in order to slow down your perception of time mm. so it's been great it's been really good but I, I've found on days where I don't do it I mean it's only been into 2024 we've been nine days in I think I've missed it tw two days because of just the mm -hmm. the onslaught of tasks calls all this you know the writing yeah. and just all the habits that I'm trying to accumulate into one and then fit, adding family and relationships on top of all that the days where I don't do it I feel less centered and my writing it's almost like my writing uh is affected by mm. and my relationships is affected by it. they get mm. affected so i'm starting to realize wow if i implement more time into this what is the greater benefit because like we can sit here and we can read all the studies of how it affects other people but until we actually go and experiment it with it with it ourselves we don't understand how it affects us but yeah, yeah it, it's definitely been it's been a journey. So how has meditation impacted your approach to acting and coaching? Because I know you've stepped into that role. Do yeah. you integrate mindfulness practice into <laughs> your training methods? Everything. <laughs> Everything. Everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but I think acting as, a, as an art form, in particularly in the kind of the journey that I have, have with it, um it's really a mindfulness practice actually i mean because presence is brought forth by mindfulness you know creativity is brought forth by the capacity of holding space and mm -hmm. waiting and you know so so for me that's always been the way and that and i think i don't know if i how aware I was that it was meditation because I, I, I'm not sure. I And I all, I've always had this kind of thing of kind of going, oh, like this is what they call meditation, but this is like acting, <laughs> you know, like, so like, ah. and, I, and I am secular in that sense, you know, and I, I've kind of throughout, <clears throat> I think I've always approached it because of my discipline, it's always been a comparative study, you know. And when I lived in Mexico with the Maya Tolteca tradition, I was very involved. But it's always like a comparative study. And it always, for me, relates back to how can we be human beings? So it's not like I that's my curiosity. That's my thing. You know, how uh, how can we what are what is our and I'm going to use this word, but I want to define it like, what is our potential? But I don't mean potential like, oh, so I score here, but if I push more, I can do this. I don't mean that. Uh, what I mean is, what are the practical possibilities of this vehicle, which we all inherently have? That's what I mean potential by potential. I like that a lot. Yeah. And that's my obsession. So when so then when I go into looking at, you know, um, the middle way or if I look at, at uh, Castaneda's work or some other teacher of mine in Mexico, you know, I'm always kind of just curious about like what is possible, you know, what is in my system, what can this system do, do you know, and my most my latest last year or, oh, well, it's a year and a half ago now, because I'm here in the Baltics, you know, like winter swimming, of course, it's down the road, like I'm, I'm right on the edge of the sea. And, and, oh, man, when you combine like medit, you know, I've been, I've been involved with meditation for 20 years, and then you go into, uh, you know, ice water yeah. with, yeah, so, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Wim Hof and breath and everything, but like actually interested in the meditative, you know, that kind of just expansion, you know, and what it can present and how the body, oh, it's very interesting. It is, it is. It's very interesting. And and to bring that back to parenting, um, sometimes when when things are very hot here in the house and there are a lot of dysregulation, 
I get a bowl out with ice water and I put my hands in it. It's called golden hands. Uh, um, you can kind of do it like properly, but I just, I just, that's the practice is sticking your hands in a bowl of ice and my kids do it. And then they do breath exercises to deal with the pain of the hands. Stimulates the nervous system and tries to. Yeah, huh. totally. I've, and I've then, done a little bit of it with like sticking my face in ice water and, and it's just recently snowed here. And so uh, <sighs> it's like below, below freezing. Great. You know, it's probably below freezing where you're at. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Quite so, a lot. Yeah. Quite a lot. So um, <laughs> just being able to get out and I've, I've started running the past six months and just getting out in the cold weather and running and just trying to, especially when tensions are high, it's very similar. Like we have a very similar experience with that, just different methods. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It works. It works. It super works. Of course it works. <laughs> the system's built for it. Come on. Absolutely. like. But yeah, so that's how I would say uh, my relationship is with meditation and mindfulness and performance and and um, the human being. Yeah, that's how I would describe it. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've found with, there's, there's so many different types of meditation and <laughs> you know, the, the I think the intentional meditation is equally as important as the like the unintentional meditation by just going mm. for a walk or you know jumping into the Baltic Sea. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a level of it there. But I found I was talking to a friend who was asking me about my photography and kind of like the process of which I go about doing it, and I was like, well, in in the moment when I'm sitting there in front of a beautiful landscape. And the sunset is the the light is just hitting properly. It's everything set up, and it's like in that moment, it's like I can't take enough photographs. Like a pixel yeah. will never be able to capture this beauty that's in front of me. I mean, yeah. and even though you know we have all these photo editing techniques and all the color grading and color correction that can go into it to enhance the image, like the the real thing is always better. And so right. I'm always flustered and it seems like I, <laughs> I go into a flow state of like, click, 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 photo, 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 click, 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 like just trying to capture it, but it's like, it's fleeting. And so yeah. I've recently taken a step back from photography to experience mm -hmm. more moments like that without having to capture it, but it's just, it's phenomenal. It's, it, that's been my obsession for the longest time is like, just how do, how do I share this with other people? you know but yeah. the, the 35 millimeter lens the the 85 millimeter lens i mean and even the 50 millimeter which is the closest to the human eye it will never actually capture what you see with your own two eyes like there's so much more to vision than just your your your, your vision system so <laughs> it's about yeah. movement and presence and embodying so yes. i've been learning a lot about that recently and trying to implement it more but we're we're at about the 45 minute mark um, yeah, I, I want let's keep this short and sweet, Carol. Sure. I, That's <laughs> I loved having this chat with you. I actually learned a lot. I'm probably going to go back and re-listen to this a couple of times when I need to ground myself <laughs> or if I ever have kids potentially. But <laughs> is there anything that you would like the audience to, if you, if you could leave the audience with a message, what would that message be? Oh, well, you were born for this. <laughs> Whatever know. you're. Yeah, whatever is going on, you were born for it. And don't doubt for one moment that you are not capable of it because you are. Yeah. I needed that. <laughs> not the audience, the audience. Can <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, this is Carolina Sandstrom. You go by Sandstrom or Sand? I do the, I do the Sand on, on Twitter. Yeah. Carolina yeah. Sand. Let's go with that. Yeah. Right. Um, I will throw in Carolina's all of her links to on X and any other social platform and also her link tree. So if you guys wanted to get some alignment coaching from Carolina and if you're a, a potential actress or actor, I think this is the person you need to talk to in order to <laughs> level up in life. So anyways, Carolina, thank you for the just jam packed insights of wisdom like i i just i this was better than i could have ever imagined so thank you so much and we're gonna have to hop on a chat again sometime but if you guys like the podcast episode please leave a five-star review on 
Spotify or Apple Podcasts. This is a zero cost way to support the podcast. And obviously we have wonderful guests like Carolina on every Tuesday. So thank you guys. Appreciate it. Bye.